This week on Q&A, University of Virginia history professor William Hitchcock. Professor Hitchcock discusses his book, The Age of Eisenhower, America and the World in the 1950s. William Hitchcock, why did you call your new book The Age of Eisenhower? Well, because I think the period from the death of Franklin Roosevelt to the death of John Kennedy, 1945 to 1963, um, is a period in which Eisenhower's personality, his ideas, his values, and of course his presidency really dominate American public life. In that period, I think it's safe to say that he was the most well-known, well-liked, a popular American because of course of his record in the war years but uh, even as he was emerging as a presidential candidate and then as president he was overwhelmingly America's favorite public figure and he gave his 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 instincts his values his um, his presence really became part of American life in the 1940s and 50s as you know there have been a lot of books written on him and I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that but first I want to show you some video of a man that you have a footnote on Stephen Ambrose, he was here in 1994 talking about Eisenhower. Let's watch this. What's different about this book that you've done from all the rest and what's new in here? Hey, well, first of all, it's based on a much broader set of interviews than anybody else's. I mean, I've, I've done four or five, ten times as much interviewing as anybody else. And it covers every level. I mean, my interviews on D-Day begin with the Supreme Commander. I spent five years working with him, interviewing him. In the footnote, and let me read it, uh, in 1984, Stephen Ambrose published the first major biography that exploited the vast documentary sources available in Abilene, Kansas, where his library is. And you write, however, in 2010, the Eisenhower Library reported that Ambrose had apparently fabricated a number of interviews with the former president and inserted unsubstantiated quotations in his text. Ambrose's work has been clouded by controversy ever since. Yes, the Eisenhower Library reported this in 2010. It was a big surprise and, um, and it's regrettable because it does cast a cloud over uh, his work on Eisenhower, which is actually excellent. Uh, he did a great deal of archival work, which can be verified. I want to hasten to stress that so much of his work is based in the printed record, and I have looked at, at those documents and actually many, many more that have been declassified. But it does appear that there are some questions about the interviews, and it's a puzzle because, of course, he didn't need to... Um, he didn't need to make up any quotations uh, because he had such abundant records from Eisenhower, but it is an issue, and, and so I think it's something we should note. I, I, I do want to stress that Stephen Ambrose did a great deal of good for not just Eisenhower studies, but for World War II studies. Um, and his role in helping to, to stand up the World War II Museum, for example, is a huge contribution to American public life. So uh, I don't want to overstate the importance of this, but for Eisenhower scholars, the, the, the question uh, has been raised. So what was available to you that wasn't available to any other scholar so far? Well, the most material that I saw that was new has been recently declassified, especially by the CIA. Um, the CIA has been un, un, you know, unlocking its vaults now quite uh, openly on the 1950s. They should never have been closed for this period for so long. But at long last, they're getting around to releasing a great deal of material. So it, it, I, I read thousands and thousands of pages of documents that other scholars have looked at. Many of them weren't working on a whole book about Eisenhower's presidency, just a, a, a narrow monograph. But the things that I saw that were quite new related to the U-2 spy plane in particular, they related to intelligence gathering around the missile question, of what did the Soviet missiles, uh, what, what Soviet capabilities were. Uh, and they related in particular to some of the covert operation planning that happened very late in the Eisenhower years that scholars are still trying to get to the bottom of. So although these may seem like small findings to scholars, it opens up the window on just what Eisenhower knew about covert operations late in his presidency. Quick biography, Kenyon College, Yale University, PhD, currently at the University of Virginia. How long have you been there? I've been at the University of Virginia now uh, almost eight years. I taught at a number of universities before that, Temple University, Wellesley College, uh, and also I taught at Yale for six years uh, after I got my PhD. So what's your broad interest in history? 
I work on the 20th century uh, international affairs. So I just finished teaching a, a history lecture class at UVA on World War II. And in the fall, I'll start teaching a, a, a Cold War history class. Those are the subjects that I really like to do. Um, and I, and I, I deal with, with what I say is you know, all the bad stuff of the 20th century, all the terrible global wars, uh, but also figures like Eisenhower who tried very hard to bring peace to a very difficult century. Early in your book, in the prologue, <clears throat> you write this, Eisenhower established a distinctive model of presidential leadership that Americans now more than ever ought to study. Why? Well, I call it the disciplined presidency. And Eisenhower, in the way he carried himself and the man that he was, was a disciplined man, a great athlete uh, when he was young, uh, a, an organized man in every respect, very methodical. But that's how he ran the White House, too. He was extremely organized. And a lot of people, especially the young senator, future president John Kennedy, kind of criticized Eisenhower's stodginess for being so disciplined and organized and predictable. But for Eisenhower, it meant that when crises came, he had a plan. He knew how to respond. He knew who to turn to. He used to say, uh, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. So you're always thinking, what's over the hill? What crisis might erupt? And we should, have a pl we should be thinking about it. So he was very systematic in the way that he governed. He met the press every week. He met congressional leaders every week. He, did, um, he chaired the National Security Council every week. And he, was, he had his thumb on the government. He trusted the process. He believed the federal government could work well if it was well led. That's something that uh, I think he still stands as a real model to learn from. What happened to his health 53 through the end of his two terms? He had some health issues, there's no doubt about it. You know, he smoked four packs of cigarettes when he was in the Army uh, and, and in World War II. Uh, a day. A day, for, <laughs> which means he basically was smoking every moment that he was awake. He quit in 1949, but I suspect it did take a bit of a toll on his health. He had a significant, a, quite a significant heart attack in 1955. And, you know, it's not altogether clear how serious it was, but it was pretty serious. And he was out of action, out of Washington anyway, for six months uh, at, a, at a time, fortunately, when there were no great crises. But that's a long time to be out of action. He then had, he had a chronic problem with his, um, his intestines, ileitis, uh, uh, that, that always gave him all kinds of stomach uh, pain throughout his life. It was finally diagnosed, and they finally operated on that, and that was in 1956. In the summer, he was actually running for re-election, so he had a significant abdominal operation then. And he had a minor stroke in, uh, later in his second term. It didn't harm him much, but it slowed him down for a couple of days and was a bit of a scare. And these things, um, you know, the mounting strain, the mounting toll of uh, having been uh, the Allied commander and then the president, I think, started to show on him. Um, of course, he lived for 10 years after he left uh, the White House, but, but these were signs of, a, of, his, of his constitution, which was very strong, I think, starting to break down a little bit. 55 was his heart attack. Yes. Here's some video at 56 when he talked to the public and the press uh, right after he came back. It is a very critical thing to change governments in this country at a time that it is unexpected. We accustom ourselves, and so do foreign countries, changing our government every four years. But always something uh, happens that uh, is untoward when a uh, government is changed at other times. It's a rather startling thing. They tell me there's even some disturbance in the stock market the day I got sick. I didn't know it until six weeks later. <laughs> they told me it was. Six months? He was. So he had the heart attack in Denver. So he spent a great deal of time at the Fitzsimmons. Flee to Washington uh, in the winter. He chaired a couple of meetings and went to Florida. Basically, he was pretty much out of out of Washington, out of the White House for almost six months. He governed. So this is a, a topic that leads us into the question of his relationship with Richard Nixon. He did not turn over much leadership to Richard Nixon, his vice president. In fact, it was his chief of staff, Sherman Adams, who did a great deal of the day-to-day -day management of the presidency. I think it's odd that he did that, but I don't think he fully was confident that Nixon turn over things to him. And he, we didn't have the succession plan of the 25th Amendment yet in place. Tell the story around President Eisenhower uh, 
offering Richard Nixon a cabinet position? Uh, in 1956, Nixon, um, uh, Eisenhower wanted Nixon to step off the ticket. And he didn't like to confront people in this way. He didn't like to fire people. He didn't want to say, you're off the ticket. Uh, what he wanted to do was to offer Nixon a cabinet position, maybe in defense, maybe uh, the commerce, and, and, and make him feel as if he was getting some experience so that he could be a more of a national figure. So he said, Dick, I think it's time for you to go and get some real experience running a big executive department. And that way, in 1960, you'll be a better candidate to be president because you'll have actually done something instead of just being vice president. Uh, and Nixon thought about this and said, well, Mr. President, are you asking me to get off the ticket? And he said, oh, no, no, I want you to get experience. I want you to be president one day. So he couldn't fire Nixon. He couldn't direct him to do it. He just offered him the opportunity. How many times did he offer him the opportunity? It went on for months. They did a two month sort of uh, back and forth on this. And Nixon didn't want to leave the vice presidency because he knew it would be perceived as a demotion. He knew it would be perceived as, uh, as having been dumped because he was very sensitive about not being taken seriously by Eisenhower. So he refused to accept the cabinet position. He said, Mr. President, I will not go to the cabinet. If you want me to be off the ticket, just say so and I'll step down. Ike wouldn't do it. So they went back and forth in this very curious way. Finally, um, uh, Eisenhower kind of gave up and said, all right, well, um, you tell me your decision, Dick. And Dick said, I would like to stay on the ticket. And Eisenhower said, okay. Here's some video of President Eisenhower talking about Richard Nixon, uh, March the 7th, 1956. I have not presumed to tell the Vice President what he should do with his own future. I have told him this. I believe he should be one of the comers in the Republican Party. He is young, vigorous, healthy, and certainly deeply informed on the processes of our government. And so far as I know, he is deeply dedicated to the same principles of government that I am. Why do you think he didn't want him on the ticket for the second go around? It's hard to say. I think he genuinely believed Nixon needed real leadership experience, and that he thought managing the Defense Department, for example, would give him practical experience in government. After all, Nixon was very young. He'd only been in the Senate for a couple of years. He'd been in the House for a couple of terms. He didn't have a great deal of, of bureaucratic experience, nothing like what Eisenhower had had running the military. So I think he really thought you know, it would help him. Um, I also think that he thought of the vice presidency as a kind of meaningless job. And, and it's true that in the 50s, uh, it wasn't common for the vice president to do much. Indeed, even Vice President Harry Truman, of course, had been kept at arm's length by President Franklin Roosevelt. Um, so Nixon, there was not much of a tradition of the vice president doing much. He occasionally chaired cabinet meetings when Eisenhower was away. That's about it. He didn't have a big portfolio. So I think he genuinely wanted him to be more seasoned. Eisenhower was very concerned that the Republican Party, that, that a the Republican succeed him. I think he did believe Nixon would be a stronger candidate in 1960, but there's no doubt there was a distance between these two men, a distance of age, of experience, a generational difference. They were not personal friends. Uh, he, Eisenhower really never opened uh, his, his personal family life to Nixon, didn't bring him to Gettysburg, didn't treat him as an intimate, not one of his closest advisors. You can see on that video that uh, that's not exactly a ringing endorsement of your number two man. He was kind of cool about it, and Nixon took it very personally. You talk about polling in the book, and we have done several polls on presidents and want to put on the screen uh, the two different polls. One of them is 1962, the Schlesinger poll, where Lincoln was number one, Washington number two, FDR number three, Jefferson number four, and Dwight Eisenhower, this was in 62, he was 21st in the poll of the most effective presidents. Our recent poll in 2017 has Lincoln number one, Washington number two, <coughs> FDR number three, and Theodore Roosevelt number four, and Dwight Eisenhower number five. What's happening here? It's a fascinating outcome and it's very interesting. And that Schlesinger 1962 poll is even worse than it looks because there were only 34 presidents uh, to choose. I think they you know picked only from 34, so 21 is a pretty low number. I think what's happening in the 60s is the difference between John Kennedy's immense popularity, his youth and his charm, and Eisenhower's age and his sense that he was a man from an earlier generation. And there's just a huge gap. Although he was, what's puzzling about that poll is, 
while he was in office, Eisenhower's poll numbers were through the roof. His average popularity rating, his average approval rating was 65% over eight years. I mean, no president comes close to that in the modern era. So while he was in office, he was enormously popular. And the fact that he sank so low also re reflects who was being polled. After all, this is Arthur Schlesinger Sr., the Harvard historian, who is putting that poll together. And he polled a great deal of other historians like Arthur Schlesinger Sr., uh, Harvard professors, people, many of whom leaned Democratic. So. I think it might reflect a little bit of the bias of the historians that were that were uh, polled in that in that poll because Eisenhower was still a very popular man in the in the early 60s but clearly younger uh, the younger Kennedy had also had an effect the later poll the way that the the later poll is very interesting because on all the categories historians were asked to evaluate uh, the president uh, Eisenhower did reasonably well in all of them but some of the other presidents, for example, John Kennedy, he started to sink a little bit on the questions of moral integrity because of his affairs in the White House. Woodrow Wilson has begun to decline a little bit because of his views on race. Andrew Jackson, who's often in the top ten, he'd begun to decline again because of his views on race and Indian removal. And that opened the field for Eisenhower to rise into the top five. So that's a remarkable achievement, and it also reflects, I think, Eisenhower's ability to govern from the center, which is an admirable quality nowadays. I will say this, and anybody who wants to can get online and look at our poll. We went out of our way to balance it politically, not just have one side as the often the Schlesinger poll was back right. in, the, in in '62. Here's a here's a, a footnote from your book hmm. uh, on the golf course <clears throat> two days after he was nominated. He told Jim Haggerty, who was his press secretary, press secretary to be, he would, quote, go to Korea, unquote, but to, quote, just keep that quiet. You found that in an oral history that was before he became president. Why did he want to keep it quiet? And didn't he promise that during the election? He did, but he wanted to drop that at the right moment. And uh, he did say that he would go to Korea during the campaign. Uh, he wanted that to have the effect that he knew that it would have. When the former Allied commander of World War II says, I'm going to go to Korea and see what's going on there for myself as a candidate, he knew it would be a provocation because it would suggest, and it did suggest, that Harry Truman wasn't running the Korean War terribly well. So he wanted to have that as a bombshell to drop in the campaign. Uh, and, and he did drop it quite late in the campaign in October. And he, he knew that Truman would be offended. Truman was offended. He called it an act of piece of demagoguery. After the fact, many people uh, debated whose idea it was. And Haggerty said at one point that, you know, it, 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 maybe it, so other, other members of the, of the team had suggested it. And, but in fact, what that showed was that I, it was Eisenhower's idea. And he said, just keep it quiet. We'll use this when we need to. And then, of course, he did say it in the campaign. And Americans responded by saying, the most successful soldier in American history is going to go to Korea, figure out why we're not winning this thing, and maybe put an end to it. And it, his, everybody knew at that moment he had won the election. Here's 17 seconds of his trip to Korea. He's dressed in his old army uniform. It was bitterly cold when the president-elect arrived in Korea to keep his campaign promise. And it was the beginning of a three-day whirlwind tour of a front now going into its third year. It was part of the general's mission to see and appraise for himself a problem on which his administration must decide. He hadn't become president yet. Hadn't, that was December 1952, so you can imagine how cold it was in Korea. He hadn't become president. You know, you have to remember, civil-military relations are pretty tense at this moment. Truman had had to fire General MacArthur, the commander in Korea, in, in 1951, because MacArthur had said Truman was not handling the Korean War well. And here goes President-elect Eisenhower now to Korea, basically saying the same thing, that something's wrong in Korea, we better fix it, I'm going to go find out what's the matter. He did go, and it actually helped, I think, his, um, his choice of policy in Korea. He came back having seen the battlefield, having seen how difficult it was to fight in Korea, how stalemated it was, how mountainous, hilly it was, and he came back determined one way or the other he was going to end this war, and it, not necessarily through an armistice. For a while he thought he would increase the pace of uh, operations in Korea until there was an opportunity to reach out for the armistice, which he was very happy to get because he knew that war wasn't wasn't popular, it needed to be brought to an end. He says very positive things about the United Nations in his first inaugural and in his farewell address to the nation. Why did he think the United Nations was a, a positive place? 
he was a great internationalist. He believed really firmly in the, the, the so-called free world, the free nations of the West, working together, working out their problems, and in a way displaying at the United Nations to the non-aligned movement, the newly in independent nations of the world, all of those states that were just getting their independence in the 1950s, that this is how democracy works. The great states can come together at the United Nations and work out their problems together. He'd been the great coalition builder in World War II, um, and, and I think he was enormously effective at listening, hearing other people, working out problems. It showed in the coalition in World War II. He loved the UN for that very reason. It was, in a sense, a projection of American democracy on the world stage. On um, a, a non-war uh, issue, well, but before I do this, let me just uh, follow up on one question. How much did he have to do with ending that Korean War? I know it, you know, we're right in the middle of a continuing discussion 50 years later, but how much did he have to do with it? Well, he, would, uh, he believed he had a great deal to do with it because he believed that he had sort of rattled the nuclear saber saying, hey, if we don't get this uh, settlement, we might have to go nuclear in Korea. And he believed that that had frightened the Chinese into coming to a, put, putting pressure on the North Koreans to agree to an armistice. But we now know a great deal about what was going on on the other side. And we know that the death of Joseph Stalin in March of 1953 had a big impact on both China and North Korea. And at that time, Stalin was all in favor of the war. And when he died in March of 53, the new leadership in the Soviet Union said, you know, we would love to bring the Korean War to an end. It's dangerous. It might get worse. It might lead to a nuclear exchange. We don't want that. So they urged the Chinese and the North Koreans to agree to an armistice. So it was the pressure from the communist side, the changes going on in the communist bloc, that led to the breakthrough. And they came to Panmunjom and they said, let's have an armistice. But I will just say, Eisenhower accepted the armistice, which he could do because he was a general, he was a Republican who had great credentials as being a military man. If he had been a peacenik before that, it might have been more politically awkward for him to embrace the armistice, curiously. It's a little bit like Nixon going to China. Eisenhower could agree to peace, um, and those who could accuse him of appeasement would be kept at arm's length. If you could sit down with him, what would you ask him? I'd ask him the question that a lot of people have asked me. What did you learn from World War II that, that really shaped your presidency? I've tried to answer that question by just extrapolating from his World War II experience, but I would like to hear him talk about that. How did it affect his judgment in crises of the presidency? What did he learn from managing the world's most complicated war on such a huge scale? How did it shape who he was as president? For those frustrated by the way I'm going on this interview, and that happens, <clears throat> I'm not trying to go from start to finish. This is a 600-page biography <laughs> of uh, Dwight Eisenhower. We've talked about him many times in the past. I'm trying to find the things in here that uh, were unique to you. This is a footnote that you wrote. <clears throat> this is about the Bay of Pigs. Mm. Eisenhower later insisted that the Cuba plan was still in its infancy when Kennedy took office and that the Kennedy could have canceled it if he wanted. And then another footnote that you wrote, the attempts of Sorensen and Schlesinger to saddle Ike with the failed plan rankled as it seemed to suggest Kennedy was imprisoned by Eisenhower's plan. Very interesting. And it gets to the heart of, first, who's responsible for the Bay of Pigs plan that failed? in April of 1961, but also who writes the history of the presidencies? Eisenhower said, hey, look, this is my story and it's accurate, and then Kennedy came along and some of Kennedy's supporters saying, no, it wasn't quite that way. Eisenhower did plan, and so and, and Alan Dulles and the CIA did plan what became the Bay of Pigs operation. There's no doubt about it. We have a great deal of evidence showing that it was a year-long process of thinking about how to invade Cuba with a group of exiles, Cuban exiles from Guatemala, and overthrow Castro. But Eisenhower didn't pull the trigger on the operation. And the reason is that it wasn't ready. It wasn't ready to go. It wasn't big enough. It wasn't strong enough. And Eisenhower himself hadn't really done the careful planning that I think would have made it potentially successful. When Kennedy gets in office, he launches it right away. Uh, it fails. He invites Eisenhower to Camp David the next day, so, you know, and Eisenhower says, well, did you do all these things? Did you ask all the tough questions? Did you go through the logistics? Did you go through the planning? And Kennedy says, I just took the advice of the generals. And Eisenhower says, well, that was your first mistake. 
So there was always, Kennedy always resented that Eisenhower gave him this plan, in a sense, but then didn't take responsibility for, for it, which perhaps he should have done. But Eisenhower's view was, you're the commander-in-chief. It's your job to ask the tough questions. If it fails on your watch, it's your responsibility. And, of course, publicly, Kennedy took responsibility for so, it. So for those that don't know the Bay of Pigs story, um, briefly, <laughs> what happened? What was the point? Well, the, the hope was to overthrow Fidel Castro in 1961, and it had, the idea had been hatched in March of 1960, a whole year earlier. But Eisenhower didn't want to invade Cuba with American soldiers. That would have been an outrageous act that everyone would have condemned. So the CIA trained a, a, about 1,000 or, or 2,000 Cubans in doing amphibious warfare, landing on ships on the beach of what, the, what was called the Bay of Pigs. And the idea was they were going to fight their way into Cuba, and they were going to set off a rebellion because everyone, they thought, hated Castro. It was kind of a cockamamie scheme to begin with. Uh, but it, it, So they were trained in Guatemala. Uh, they were given arms. The Americans helped get them on ships and got them to Cuba. The thing went wrong from the very beginning. The Cubans saw what was happening very quickly, responded very quickly. Uh, they, they, they sank a number of their ships. It was a mess. And then uh, it, it was a terrible embarrassment to President Kennedy because it was obvious that Americans had supported this thing from the beginning. What would President Eisenhower have done about the Vietnam situation, and would he have gotten us in as far as we, with 550,000 troops? Well, we know what he did do, which is he kept the United States out of Vietnam in 1954 as the French were collapsing in northern Vietnam. Their colonial war there was going badly, and he, the French begged the United States to get in, and Eisenhower said, no, we're not going to do it. So we know that he, he stayed out, and we know what he said at the time. It's the wrong war in the wrong place for the wrong purposes. We're not going to go to war to help prop up French colonialism. He then though, invested a great deal of prestige and money in building South Vietnam into a democratic Asian country. He believed South Vietnam could be a model to the rest of Asia. So by 1961, the commitment America had made to South Vietnam was a very significant one. By 1965, when Lyndon Johnson decides to send in thousands, hundreds of thousands of troops, the commitment was even greater. So it's difficult to know if Eisenhower would have done the same thing. I think there's a good chance he might have, because I think he believed what America was doing in South Vietnam was the right thing. So you talk about the CIA information that was released later on. What did you learn about the CIA's involvement during the Eisenhower years with the new information? Well, uh, the big picture what I will say, and I, 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 I don't say this exactly in these words in the book, but I have concluded that Alan Dulles, who was the CIA director for the entire uh, the time that Eisenhower was president, was a pretty dangerous man. And he kept promoting covert operations and sabotage and operations of that kind to Eisenhower very enthusiastically. Early on, overthrowing government in Iran and Guatemala, 53 and 54, but later doing all kinds of other operations around the world. Eisenhower came to, he was wary about Alan Dulles, but I don't think he controlled Alan Dulles sufficiently, and he gave him a little bit too much free reign. So the CIA became quite reckless, and we would learn later, um, later when some of their secret records became available in the late 70s, just how far they had gone to overthrow governments, plan assassination, sabotage, and the like. Much of that was known because the Congress started investigating the CIA in the 1970s. But there are a lot of concrete, specific things about how the CIA gathered intelligence, what they knew, especially through uh, intercepts about the Soviet missile program, that we're only just now beginning to understand. So what countries did, did, we, did the CIA go in and assassinate a leader? Well, uh, they tried to assassinate Patrice Lumumba of the Congo. Lumumba was a, a radical, no doubt about it, and the CIA did come up with a, an extraordinary scheme to try to, uh, to, to, to murder him. They, they, they secreted a, a terrible sort of uh, you know, bi biological uh, uh, agent in, in a toothpaste tube and gave it to the head of the CIA station in, in the Congo, and they hoped that he could get this toothpaste tube to, into Lumumba's, you know, <laughs> bathroom kit, and there he would brush his teeth and then drop dead. 
the CIA man in in, uh, in the Congo said, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. I'm never going to do that. And he put the thing away and locked it up. So it didn't happen. But it was on the planning. Uh, it was He was supposed to be trying to, to kill Lumumba. As it turned out, Lumumba had plenty of enemies in the Congo. And he was arrested uh, and he was eventually killed by his uh, internal enemies. But it's just an indication that the CIA was trying to. They also, of course, came up with dozens of goofy schemes to try to kill Fidel Castro. And some of them were really so strange and comical that you have to laugh. One of them, one of them involved uh, the idea of, of build, making, a, <laughs> making a, an exploding seashell, because they knew that Castro liked to go uh, uh, snorkeling and pick up interesting shells. And if they figure they've got a really interesting seashell, he might go dive down for it, pick it up, and it would blow up. I mean, just goofy stuff. But much more concretely, they did try to get uh, some Cubans um, who were in the underworld to assassinate Did him. President Eisenhower know this? That's a great debate. Eisenhower's advisors, Andrew Goodpaster, uh, one of his closest advisors, always, always insisted that Eisenhower did not know about it and he would not have approved it. I'm not quite so sure. I think that Eisenhower um, did know. I think that uh, his national security advisor late in, the, in his presidency, uh, Gordon Gray, kept him informed. I think they had an understanding not to talk about it. I think it was a kind of wink and a nod sort of thing. But Eisenhower was unsentimental about these matters. Lifelong military man, he felt these were bad, bad people. Um, and if national interest required it, he would let it go. 1952, during the campaign, October the 11th, here's President Truman talking about uh, General Eisenhower. Now, the Republican candidate for president, who has much to learn about these things, has begun to catch on to this business of Me Tooism. He's been against federal aid to education, against Social Security. No better than prison, he called it. He is against federal action in the field of health. But in a speech in Los Angeles just the other day, he said he was for extending Social Security a little bit. He said he is for federal aid to education just a little bit. He said he is for medical care just a little bit. I can give him a piece of advice. He need not be so timid. The special interest lobbies won't bite him now. I thought he uh, offered to step down as president if Dwight Eisenhower would run. He loved Eisenhower in 1945 and uh, even up to 1948. Uh, the, he thought that Eisenhower would be a, a good president. He, he thought he might be a Democrat, that's why. Nobody knew what party Eisenhower was in when he was in the army. And Truman thought maybe he could, he could, uh, he could st get Ike to run, and, and Truman said, I'll be your vice president. But, uh, but he, in 1945, he really did say to Eisenhower, while they were touring Berlin, actually, uh, Truman was in Berlin for the Potsdam meeting, he said, General, I'll get you any, I will do anything that I can possibly do to, to help your career, and that includes your being president. Because he admired him so much, and that was a time Truman had just Too, you can tell there's a frosty relationship, and that's because Eisenhower had been speaking out politically in 1951 and 52, criticizing the New Deal, criticizing Roosevelt, criticizing Truman himself, criticizing the big federal programs of the Eisenhower did. And there uh, dinner speech. And that's like a lot of people who run for president. They tend to say different things to different audiences. Eisenhower was just as good a politician as anyone. But the relationship between these two men soured, and it's really too bad. What's, you paint this picture, but what's the difference? House to ride with Truman up to the Capitol, and the day that John F. Kennedy came to the White House to ride up Yeah. Uh, fortunately, capital. it got better. It couldn't have been worse at the, with the Truman relationship, and it got better. Um, the, the relationship with Kennedy was better. The, the, they, the, the relationship had been poisoned by the campaign between Ike and Truman. And when Truman came to the, to the to, when Eisenhower came to the White House to ride together to the Capitol, it was very frosty. Um, he, Eisenhower almost didn't want to ride in a car together. They didn't have the traditional. Uh, sort of meeting of, 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 uh, with coffee and, and, and chatter and so on. It was very, very icy. Truman had said some really very critical things about Eisenhower during the campaign, which I think were unnecessary, and Eisenhower took it personally. He shouldn't have, but he did.
So it was pretty bitter. Uh, uh, but eight years later, it's a very different relationship. Um, Eisenhower was very angry that John Kennedy won the 1960 election, no doubt about it. And Kennedy had criticized Eisenhower in the campaign. Kennedy had said terrible things about Eisenhower. But by 1960, Eisenhower was a much more seasoned politician. He knew it wasn't personal. And what he wanted was a good handoff, a good handoff to the new president. And so they met twice before the inauguration, two different occasions. And each time they met for a long time, they talked through world problems, they really discussed what was going on. Uh, Eisenhower said, look, it's a tough job and I want to help you any way I can. Um, here's what I learned on the job. Here are a few pointers, so to speak. Kennedy came away very impressed with Eisenhower every time he met him. He's, they, he realized this man is a serious, a serious figure, which is not what he'd said on the campaign trail. He said, oh, he's such a dummy. He's, a, he, he's such a dunce. He's, he's asleep at the wheel. But when he met him in person, he realized what a significant figure Ike was. This is one of their meetings. Uh, you, it's the day before the inauguration where you have President Kennedy and, and President Eisenhower. Just 20 seconds. Talk with the president and the his responsible offices on some of the major problems which face the United States in our relations abroad, and uh, they brought us up to date on their thinking on those problems as of today. How was the atmosphere in there? Very cordial as it's been since uh, November 9th. Uh, famous correspondent Ray Sher of NBC standing right next to him there a long, long time ago. Yeah. Um, you, you report in your book. The, uh, two two different things. One is that he attended 300 and some National Security Council meetings uh, out of 300 and some. Yeah. And you also say that he had a lot of news conferences on a regular scheduled basis and that in 1955 he did started television. Yeah. What does this say about him as far as you're concerned? It shows that he was deeply engaged in running the government. He, he, he chaired 90%. The number figure is 90% of the meetings of the National Security Council. Almost every week he sat down with his top national security team, Secretary of State, CIA head, um, various military figures, and they talked through the world problems. He was deeply engaged in every detail of running the government. And the reason that's important is because the press didn't see that. And what they saw was Ike golfing a lot. They saw him on vacation a lot. But they didn't know just how deeply involved he was in the policy making and the, in the detailed nitty gritty of running the government. And we know that now, so it's easy for us to say he was deeply engaged, but it wasn't always perceived that way. But I think it shows how, how disciplined he was. On the press conferences, I think it's quite remarkable. We've sort of forgotten that presidents used to be much more available to the press than they are today. A press conference nowadays with the president is a highly scripted thing. Uh, they're very, it's very formal. Um, you, you're not going to get a lot of, uh, of, of you know, mistakes or goofs or real news out of a press conference with the president nowadays. Um, the press secretary does it all. Nineteen throughout Eisenhower's presidency, he gave a weekly, weekly press conference for about thirty minutes. He stood there and he took questions. Sometimes he didn't know the answer and he would say, I'll, I'll look into it, I'll get back to you. His press secretary, Jim Haggerty, was right next to him doing all this. Occasionally he would pass him a note or two, but Ike was available to the press. Now, he didn't tell him a lot, but he was there. And I think that's, that he felt that's what the president should do. Well, you point out that it was radio until 1955 and then it was television. I have to say this is a fun clip because when we first saw it, the first question is asked by somebody that he's no longer alive, but he worked here at the end of his career, a fellow named Bob Clark, who was with ABC for years. And at this time, he was with International News Service. Let's just watch the first question on television oh, great. Uh, of Eisenhower. Well, I see we're trying a new experiment this morning. I hope it doesn't prove to be a disturbing influence. I have no uh, announcements. We'll go directly to questions. Could you discuss the seriousness of the latest communist attacks on national islands in the China Sea in the light of our commitments to defend promote it? No a military authority that I know of has tried to rate these small islands that are now under attack, or indeed the Tashin themselves, as an essential part of the defenses of Formosa and the Pescadores to the defense of which we are committed. What was his relationship with the media? Can I just say one thing about, about, sure. before, about what he was actually saying there? Yeah. Did you see how good he was? He thought for a split second, all right, that, he, he got thrown a very hard question. 
the first question on TV, he got thrown a really delicate question that was a question of defending Taiwan from communist China, who were at that point threatening to invade Taiwan. And he didn't want to pour oil on the, the flames, but he also had to say, well, there's a thing going on there that we're sort of in control of. Here's the big picture. And he gave a very diplomatic answer. To those who are experts on it, it's very impressive how good he was on his feet. Now, his relationship with the press was actually um, uh, quite good. The press, though, they admired him privately, but they often, in writing, in, the, in, the, in their reports, tended to condescend a little bit to President Eisenhower. And I think this is part of the origins of the idea that he wasn't in charge, that he was a lightweight. Uh, I think that they knew better, but I think it, it was a good joke. It became kind of a, almost a, a punchline to say, well, here's old Eisenhower trying his best, but look how he stumbles over his syntax and so forth. They could be kind of mean. Here's a, uh, your words from a, a footnote in the back of your book. Uh, this comes from the, actually it says here, I think the Dallas Papers. Anyway, Ike liked, this is you saying, Ike liked deception and wanted to keep his enemies guessing about just how far he might go to protect non-communist states in Asia. His close advisor, General Walter uh, Bedell Smith admitted to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in February of 1954 that the administration had, quote, no intention of putting ground soldiers into Indochina. And he hated having to say so in public. He would rather keep the Chinese guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, it sounds like a cliche, but it is really true that Eisenhower was actually a, you know, it's a personal characteristic, but it does influence this. He was a world-class card player. Not just poker player, bridge player. He was, you know, he, he loved to keep his, his, uh, his, his enemies guessing, his adversaries guessing. The Chinese, especially in the Cold War, but the Russians as well. He didn't want to go into public uh, like that and say, well, here's exactly what our policy is, unless it served his interests. Sometimes it served his interest to say, as in Taiwan, if there is an invasion of Taiwan, that will lead to war. He was very happy to say those kinds of things because it was a signal to the Chinese. But in general, he wanted to keep his enemies uh, guessing and, and who wouldn't. But that also reflects his, his leadership in the war years. He didn't want to tell the Germans what he, what he was doing either. Why did you say in a footnote that Eisenhower biographers tend to muddle the U-2 story? According to Gene Edward Smith, Eisenhower remained calm and unperturbed because of, quote, ironclad evidence provided by extensive CIA surveillance flights over the Soviet Union, unquote. So the, the conventional wisdom before me was that Eisenhower didn't worry about the missile gap, didn't worry that the Russians might have had a lot of missiles, didn't worry about Sputnik because he knew because of the U-2 spy plane, he knew the Soviets actually didn't have any big missile program at all. That's actually not true. The U-2 spy plane had started in 1955. They started r running it over the Soviet Union in 1956. Eisenhower was always very cautious about using it because he was afraid one might get shot down and that would lead to an international incident, which, which it did in 1960. So in 1957, 1958, 1959, Eisenhower almost shuts down the program. So there are no or very, very few U-2 overflights in 1957 and 58 and even into 59, uh, and that's because Eisenhower has, has tried to put the brakes on the program. So what they know about the Soviet missile program is incomplete. It's unclear what, what they have. It's not clear. So to say that, well, he just kicked back and said, I, I know, I, don't worry, there's no, there's no Soviet missile program. They didn't have the evidence to prove that. They were actually quite anxious that the Russians were building some major internet, you know, uh, ICBMs that could reach America. Um, and it, it, it wasn't until quite a bit later that they got the intelligence that proved the Russians were way behind the Americans. I want to ask you about the bias of um, historians. And you write, again, another footnote, that uh, Blanche Wiesen Cook's analysis, and she was the chief biographer of Eleanor Roosevelt, has done a three book series. But you say Blanche Wiesen Cook's analysis of Eisenhower's presidency she confessed was so clouded by the evidence she discovered of covert operations, secrecy, dirty tricks, and counterinsurgency in his administration that she had trouble seeing any other dimension of his leadership. 
she, there was, she also finished this, your quote saying, <clears throat> Eisenhower's legacy is counterinsurgency and political warfare. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's a wonderful question. Uh, and I will say that uh, I tried my darndest, and I really tried my darndest, to write history in a way that no one reading this book would know, would know anything about me, an author, about my politics. There is no effort here to shape a contemporary reading of Eisenhower to say he was good at this, bad at that, or I condemn him for all of these things. That's not the purpose for me of, of writing history. It's to try to figure out why did powerful people make the choices that they did. Well, what's now, your take on others? And as you went through your research on, yes. and you've done several other books. Yes. Well, I mean, one can be, well, uh, we always evaluate other historians' work. Um, and uh, the goal is not to be a smarty pants and say, you got that wrong, but rather I have some new material that I can bring, or I'm taking a slightly uh, different approach in some way to, to shed new light on it. Uh, every generation, I think, takes another crack at presidents, um, at presidential, we're going to keep writing presidential biographies. Let me ask you differently, then. Are we being treated well as a populace from historians? I think we're being treated very well. I hope that the, the public is, is consuming the wonderful history that is coming out. But readers have to be skeptical because historians have biases that are built in, not just political ones, and they're often not overt. But every historian has a different view, a different way of writing uh, uh, about a powerful figure like a president. So my advice is read three books on a given individual like a president or a, a public figure and then make your own judgment about where you think the truth may lie. When did you start this book? I started it in 2009-10. I had finished a book on the liberation of Europe that uh, focused just on 1944-1945 and was a military and social history of Europe at the end of World War II. Eisenhower was a bit player in that book. Um, it was a difficult book to write because it was kind of depressing about the war. And I wanted to try biography. I had never written a biography before. And I'd come across Eisenhower in that, in that work and thought, what an interesting man. A lot has been written about his war leadership, and I felt the books on his presidency were not quite as strong. So there was an opportunity there. Where did you go in order to research it? I spent the bulk of the time for researching this book in Abilene, Kansas, at the Eisenhower Presidential Library. Of course, I did research here in Washington, D.C., at a number of the uh, National Archives and Library of Congress as well. But Abilene is really where you have to go not just because that's where Eisenhower's papers are located, the, the private papers, but because that's his hometown. And the more time I spent in Abilene and the more time I spent in Kansas, the closer I felt I was getting to this man. Um, he was a very famous, very successful, worldly cosmopolitan figure, but he really was from Kansas, and he never forgot it, and he talked about it a lot. I felt getting to know, seeing his house so many times, walking around the town, feeling the the landscape, which is so different from the East Coast, I, I just started to feel like I started to get a read on this man. You write, the assertion made by Tom Wicker, who's formerly of the New York Times, that Warren, that's Earl Warren, the former Chief Justice, had, quote, received no help at all from the Eisenhower administration in helping prepare the Brown opinion is demonstrably false. Oh, yeah. No, the Brown versus Board opinion of May 1954, huge, huge milestone in civil rights. It, 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 it showed that, uh, you know, it argued, it, it, it told us it, that the segregation by race of public schools was unconstitutional. Uh, some people thought maybe this was a, a, a you know, bombshell that the Eisenhower administration knew, knew nothing about and maybe even was hostile to. But there's ample evidence that the Attorney General, Herbert Brownell, was working closely uh, with the plaintiffs in the case shaping the arguments in the court and that they knew and that they in fact favored. They filed a brief, uh, an amicus brief in favor of desegregation. Uh, they felt too it was unconstitutional. So this was a product of the administration's policies as much as Warren. Now Warren shaped the opinion which was so important and it was a unanimous opinion. But this is a case where uh, Eisenhower's reputation has been done wrong. Uh, he was often depicted as someone who was against uh, the civil rights movement or in some ways a day late, a dollar short. But in that early period of his first term, he and Herbert Brownell really helped the cause. They did uh, significant work uh, pushing the ball forward. However, you write this, 
Some scholars have recently tried to make Eisenhower into a hero of the civil rights movement, an argument that surely overstates the case. Well, what's interesting about Eisenhower is you get this, he blows hot and cold. And we see periods of significant activity, and 53 and 54 are, is probably the, the best period where he's really pushing. Then he pulls back and says, wait a minute, I have a lot of friends in the South. Um, he, he, and he did, and he spent a lot of time at Augusta. And they should be heard from too. They should be take their views should be taken into consideration. They don't want to go too fast. So he would then try to try to cool things down. And then he would pick up again, and there would be a sudden period of activity. And we see the 1957 is such a period of activity, passing the Civil Rights Act of 1957, the intervention at Little Rock. But then again, after that, 1958, 59, he's quite loath to do anything really aggressive on civil rights. So it's a picture of a pendulum swinging back and forth, I think. I went back, uh, th this was not pegged to your book, I went back and d did this myself. I got his inaugural addresses and uh -huh. then his farewell speech. Uh, and I just wanted to get the, you know, the flavor of it. The thing that was interesting about it is how much he mentioned God mm -hmm. and faith in the first inaugural address and freedom. Uh, but he starts off right away by saying, let's pray. He, the, his inaugural address, he opens up with a brief prayer that he himself wrote. He didn't pull it out of the scripture. He said, I'm just going to write something myself. Deeply spiritual man raised in a family of uh, deeply spiritual parents who were uh, members of the River Brethren Church, offshoot of the Mennonites. Um, you know, his long, his forebears were, had come from Pennsylvania. They'd been essentially what we think of as Amish. Um, his father read a piece of scripture every night uh, at, in the family living room. All the boys had to sit around and listen. He, he knew his Bible backwards and forwards. He did not enjoy attending church, and when he, became, when he went to the army, he's kind of steered clear of organized religion. And he's the only, this is so interesting, so surprising, so important for Eisenhower. When he became president, he said, I have to be seen as a public man of faith. I have to go to church every week, so I need a regular church. And Mamie was a Presbyterian, so he went to the uh, Reverend Edward Elson of the National Presbyterian uh, Church here in Washington, D.C., and he was baptized a sitting president was baptized February 1953, uh, and he then used religion as a very important part of his public uh, personality as president. His first inaugural was 2,459 words long. His second was only 1,658. But th right there in the third paragraph or fourth paragraph, he says, before all else, we seek upon our common labor as a nation the blessings of Almighty God. Yeah. <laughs> what was the action? I mean, if what would a president get if he, he spent so much time today on religion in an inaugural address? What would happen, do you think? Oh, well, I, th I don't know. I think there would be a lot of eyeball rolling and some criticism. But, um, but Eisenhower was an unashamed, fervent believer in, in God and in a higher power. It was very much who he was. What makes him interesting is that he was not from a high church you know, Episcopalian, for example, background. He had this nonconformist uh, background as a very humble, close to the earth, a river brethren upbringing. So he, he didn't wear it on his sleeve, so to speak. But as president, he felt it was really important to be seen as a, a prayerful man. And um, it wasn't an act for him. Definitely was not an act for him. You know, he was thrilled. And, and of course, church leader membership was going up a lot in the 1950s. Americans were becoming quite, it was a bit of a spiritual awakening in that decade. Eisenhower championed that. And you remember they put in God we trust on our currency in this period. Um, and they put uh, under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. That was added under Eisenhower's years. So. Let me ask you about his farewell address. Uh, everybody quotes the military industrial complex warning, but there's another paragraph in here that I need your uh, help and understanding. Talked about disarmament. He said, together we must learn how to compose difference, not with arms, but with intellect and, and decent purpose, because this need is so sharp and apparent, I confess that I lay down my official responsibilities in this field with a definite sense of disappointment. As one who has witnessed, this is his last speech to the nation as president, as one who has witnessed the horror and the lingering sadness of war, 
as one who knows that another war could utterly destroy this civilization, which has been so slowly and painfully built over thousands of years, I wish I could say tonight that a lasting peace is in sight. Yes, isn't that interesting that a man stepping down wouldn't crow about all of his achievements, but instead say, there's still work to be done. I've left one big thing undone. And the tone of that speech is a warning, which is we've had to build the military industrial complex in order to protect our freedoms. And he said, I'm, I reg I, he basically said, I regret we had to do that, but we have done it. We've created this enormous military power based on nuclear arms. And he said, we now have to control it. We would love to get rid of it completely, but unfortunately, the Russians won't let us. They're just as aggressive and dangerous as ever. So he was saying, essentially, his preference would be total global disarmament. His preference would be peace. Um, but he hadn't achieved that. What he had achieved was creating a, a defense system that would protect America, but it didn't, wasn't the same thing as world peace. When he was president, there were two and a half um, billion people in the United States. There are now, now 7.6 billion people. In the world. I'm absolutely in the world. Uh, there were 160 million Americans, and now there are 325 yeah. million Americans. But what is that? You know, what impact has that had alone on the way we are today in, this, in our society? You know? Well, uh, certainly, I, I, I think one thing I can say about Eisenhower: uh, he, he, the, the, the scale and scope of the U.S. government and indeed of the United States was was a bit more manageable in the mid 50s than it is today. So that while I think Eisenhower can teach us some basic things about governance and about humility and about generosity, kindness, moderation. Um, the U.S. government has just become so big and it's so difficult for any one president, no matter how gifted, to com be in complete command of. So I, I think that it's dangerous to say, well, he this president is exactly what we should do today. But I think we can be inspired by a character and the character of experience, character of knowing where you come from, a character of generosity, humility. Those are things that Eisenhower had. We talked about you being at the University of Virginia now teaching. Where is your hometown originally? I, um, I, my hometown is Chevy Chase, Maryland, but I was born in Japan and I lived a number of years in Japan and also in Tel Aviv, Israel, because my dad worked for the U.S. State Department. What did he do? He was a foreign service officer, was, a, was head of the U.S. information agency branches in the, Jap in the U.S. Embassy in Japan and in uh, Tel Aviv. How about your mom? My mother was uh, uh, his loyal and incredibly hardworking helper as a diplomatic couple. You have a family, you have children? I do, I have two children, uh, Benjamin and Emma, and Benjamin is a junior at the University of Virginia, and I'm delighted to say my daughter Emma is going to join him next year. Our guest has been William Hitchcock, and the name of the book is The Age of Eisenhower, America and the World in the 1950s. Thank you very much. Thank you. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qnda.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. Next week on Q&A.